Hi, I'm Yuna Patel, Palestine News Director at Mondawise. I sat down with Palestinian lawyer and analyst Deanna Butu to speak about the role social media is playing right now in the genocide in Gaza and how many of us feel like we're being gaslit by our politicians and world leaders on a daily basis. In this conversation, we speak about everything from the Israeli propaganda machine and the detrimental role that the Israeli army's own soldiers may be playing in that, and of course, what it means for Palestinians that their genocide is being played live on screens around the world. Take a listen. To start off, I wanted to ask you sort of what your experience has been in that regard. As you've been, you know, you're in Palestine, you are in 48, so you are experienced it, experiencing this occupation and apartheid in a way that's very different to Gaza, but it still is this collective experience that Palestinians have been going through. So what has this been like? And I know this is a big question. What has this been like for, for you to be witnessing this genocide happening, obviously witnessing the changes happening around you where you live in real time, but also witnessing these atrocities from your telephone or from your television screen? Oh, you know, where do I begin? One of the most difficult things is being 150 kilometers away from Gaza, from, from, Gaza, from Gaza and knowing what Israel's doing 150 kilometers away and mm-hmm. yet living in a society that is openly cheering this on and then suppressing any attempts to bring forward any voices or any criticism of what Israel is doing. And, and I, I know that you know this, but I, I've, had the, I've had the privilege of living in, in Gaza. I lived there for a year and a half um, in the early 2000s or mid 2000s. And, and so I have many, many, many friends there. And I'm not the only one who has friends there. Every Palestinian I know has either friends or family living in Gaza. And even if they don't, our hearts are there. And so when you're living in 48, as I'm living, you live in a space where you're surrounded by people who are cheering on the genocide, who are openly advocating for genocide, and at the same time, repressing any attempts to talk about what Israel's doing. So for example, Israel has barred any and all protests against this war, with the exception of protests that are carried out in Tel Aviv by the Jewish Israeli community. Um, Palestinians in 48 have been arrested for things like Facebook posts or even liking a picture on Instagram. We've seen that hundreds of students have been disciplined, not for anything that they did on campus, but again, for social media posts, for even liking a social media post, with these universities even going so far as to then send these complaints to the police themselves. Mm -hmm. And, And one of the things that's the most disturbing about this is that this isn't just the the state apparatus that's going after Palestinians. It's it's your neighbor. It's your colleague. It's the person you're at study group with. And you just see that this whole machinery of, of, um, of, of supporting genocide is against you. You For example, in Haifa, where, where I live, there are now militias that you see openly roaming the streets carrying weapons and they go through your social media posts and they and people place you on a list. I know that I personally have been placed on a list. I know that I personally have been subjected to um, complaints to the Israeli police for interviews that I have given. And I'm not alone. We've seen the arrest of people like Dalal Abu Amni for a Facebook post that says there is no protector but God or the arrest of Maysa Abdel Hadi for, uh, for liking an Instagram post, which she then later removed. So it's to, to live here is to live in a society that is openly supporting, in some cases, advocating genocide and feeling that you are next. 
But it doesn't just stop there. You then look down at your phone and you see the level of dehumanization that Palestinians go through on a daily basis. Again, not just from the Israelis, but globally. Everything from the way that this um, genocide is being covered, everything from whether they label it a genocide, whether they listen to what Israeli leaders are saying when they openly advocate ethnic cleansing and genocide, whether um, they are, are wholeheartedly going along with the bombing of hospitals and schools and the measures that Israel's taking to bomb not only the North, but the South, and somehow framing this as phases to a war. So being a Palestinian here is to be living in the belly of the beast, to be surrounded by people who are supporting and advocating genocide, and yet knowing that 150 kilometers away, Israel's carrying out a genocide, and, and we just might be next. I think you hit on this experience that I have, you know, witnessed from my Palestinian friends and something that everyone has been experiencing of living in, as you described it, the belly of the beast, whether it be in 48 or in Ramallah or Bethlehem in the West Bank, or of course, um, you know, in Jerusalem or Gaza, everyone is experiencing different degrees and levels, right, of Israel's occupation and apartheid and Israeli violence from the settlers, as you mentioned, from your neighbors, maybe wherever, if you're living in 48, um, or from like the, the soldiers and the state itself. And as you're experiencing that, you mentioned you're also looking at your phone screen and seeing the entire world or the political establishment in the U.S., for example, which is fund funding this genocide, you're seeing the active denial of your experience that like, you are currently going through. And I mean, for me, as I would describe someone from the outside looking in, someone you know who cares about Palestine, and um, it's incredibly like not just fr frustrating doesn't even begin to describe sort of that feeling of like witnessing, experiencing, um, being a part of this reality and then having people deny it. So I can't imagine what that experience like it was like for you and for other Palestinians. You know, um, to, to live in Palestine or to be Palestinian is to live with this constant sense of of nakba denial or nakba apology mm -hmm. right and especially in in when you live here in 48 israelis are either nakba deniers or they're nakba apologists there's very few who who condemn the nakba and who are actively trying to advocate for the right of return you know the, the numbers are few and and so you have to fast forward that 75 years and what we're living today is the Nakba 2.0, which is exactly what Israeli politicians are calling it, is Nakba 2.0. So it's the, the same. It's either genocide apologists or genocide deniers, and, um, or, or even worse, the, the open, you know, open supporters of it. And, and, and there's few here who are stepping back and saying, this is genocide. We have to stop. So it's the the feeling of of constantly being gaslit. Like well, I can give you an example. At one point in time, the Israelis came out and said something like, "We can't be certain of the number of people who've been killed in Gaza because." These are numbers that are being counted by the people in Gaza. Well, you know, you only believe that if you are actively dehumanizing people. Of course, the numbers are going to be counted by the people in Gaza. Who else are they going to be counted? Exactly. Who else are they going to be counted by? But then the, the amazing thing is that from that one statement, instead of 
their reaction being, instead of the U.S. reaction, for example, being the reaction that you and I just had, which is, of course, they're going to be counted by the people in Gaza. Where else are they going to be counted? Or by whom else are they going to be counted? The response was, yeah, we can't believe those numbers. And so then Palestinians then have to further dehumanize themselves by issuing a 212-page document with the names, the ages, and the ID numbers of all of the, at that point in time, 7,067 Palestinians that had been killed up until that date. And even despite issuing this document with all 7,067 names, that 212 pages up until that point, you still had people who were, who were also questioning and still question the numbers. And so it leads you to believe, well, what did you think was going to happen when on a weekly basis, Israel's dropping 6,000 bombs on a place that is 365 square kilometers? Of course, there's going to be close to 30,000 people killed. Of course, there's going to be in the thousands of people who are still trapped in rubble. Of course, there's going to be in the tens, if not higher, thousands of people who've been injured. Of course it is. But but we're still trapped in this cycle where because Palestinians have been so dehumanized that you're still even having to prove that you've that you've been killed. You have to prove that the, the people who've been injured have been injured. You you have to prove that Israel has flattened Gaza, even though they've said that they're flattening Gaza. Right. It's like you're always in a in a place where you have to prove everything that Israel has said that it's going to do and is doing. Yeah. And I think you, this experience that you're talking about of like Palestinians having to, the way you put it, further dehumanize themselves by trying to just prove that we are in fact being killed. We are in fact being exterminated. Um, I think is an experience truly at least in, in this point of time, unique to to Palestinians. And, you know, in my experience studying Palestine, living in Palestine, reporting about Palestine, um, and also, you know, being a journalist and having studied media, I'd always thought, and, and, and still to a degree, um, you know, with the emergence of social media, really felt like, okay, social media in all of its, um, you know, <laughs> levels. And um, I, I had always felt that social media could and does offer a space for a different narrative, right? So with the existence of social media, Palestinians in this case do not have to rely anymore on, um, you know, mainstream media outlets and networks like CNN, for example, to be telling their own story or telling the world what is happening to Palestinians. So you think, right, okay, with social media, Palestinians are telling their own stories. That means people will believe them. And we're actually seeing that at least, and I think, you know, and I want to talk about this more, I think social media really has changed things in the sense that a lot of people really are witnessing for the first time with their own eyes around the world what is happening to the Palestinians. But at the same time, we're seeing this extreme reaction to that um, of everyone is witnessing what's happening, but there is this extra level of gaslighting with that, you know, of like, no, actually, this is not happening to Palestinians. Um, actually, you know, there is a genocide. Hamas is trying to commit a genocide against the Jewish people. And Jewish people around the world are experience a gen experiencing a genocide. Or, you know, um, the real threat right now is on campuses, for example, right? And anti-Semitism on campuses. So there's this extreme gaslighting of Palestinians and then also like deflection, right, to other issues, be it manufactured um, or, you know, exaggerated to essentially like detract from Palestinian experiences. And that has been 
one of the most kind of mind boggling experiences is to like see that play out and see politicians and congressional hearings and the media talking about, you know, the dangers of, of uh, anti-Semitism on U.S. campuses and how chants are calling for the genocide of the Jewish people when in reality there is, a, there is an active genocide happening. Yes. Yeah. Look, I, I, there's a few things to say about social media. First, um, social media does remove that gatekeeping, right? It, it removes those barriers. You don't have that barrier to access that, that was once there. But social media is also a series of silos. And, and you follow those accounts that you want to follow, and you don't follow those accounts that you don't want to follow. So there's certainly a, a lot of activity on social media. And we do see that, that despite the billions, and it is in the billions, that Israel has invested in, um, in PR campaigns, in, uh, in trying to influence in social media, the the numbers are definitely not in their favor because they have a bad product. Let's let's be clear. So all of that, and 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 of course, there's ways that they can put pressure to to have people shadow banned and to change algorithms and to have to have it uh, such that people's accounts get taken down. I mean, we've seen we've seen all of this, but at the same time, despite all of that, we've seen that there have been some real breakthroughs. And, and that people are becoming much more aware of what's happening in Palestine. So these issues that are manufactured are precisely that, manufactured. And as much as they're manufactured, I think because people are seeing the images that we're seeing, that uh, and, and they're small, right? Like they're, because of all the shadow bans and all these other things, we're not seeing the full extent of it. And of course, because we don't live in Gaza, we are not seeing the full extent of it either. But despite all of that, we're seeing that people aren't believing the manufactured stuff. And, and so for me in particular, it feels so odd to be sitting in a place where it's a, a, a genocide is being, massacre after massacre is being perpetrated every day. Genocide is being carried out every day. Um, the Israelis have been clear about the ethnic cleansing process of of Gaza. They've been clear. Every every level of, of government has been clear. And yet you see that that rather than Israelis focusing on what they are doing, they're instead focused on creating a totally different reality in a totally different country. Um, and, and perpetuating this narrative that um, that is that is designed to deflect from what they're doing and they are deflecting from what they're doing. You know, they, they aren't paying attention. Being here is such an exercise in, I don't even know the word. It's like, it's like living in a parallel universe. You, you turn on the news and you hear about Israeli soldiers killed. It then pivots to, um, a person who rallies up Israelis to say we have to hit Palestinians more. There should be a hundred thousand killed. Uh, there shouldn't be a single Gazan left. I mean, this is on the news daily, by the way. To then pivoting to um, how 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 much how persecuted Israel is, and and you the whole time what's missing in all of this is what is it that Israel is actually doing in Gaza. And the whole point and the reason that they're not covering this is because they want to deflect. They don't want people to see. And I, I can't I'm not going to cut them slack and say they don't know. Of course, they know what's happening. Mm -hmm. You can't look at numbers and say you, you have every ability to check any news outlet around the world and see the numbers of Palestinians who've been who've been killed. You can't look at that and say, oh, but um, but the way in which. Th that Israel is operating is to forever put itself in the role of the victim, even though it's the perpetrator of a genocide. Yeah. And that's the part that's so hard to, to wrap your head around. And the last point that you made is that Israel has always, you know, throughout history positioned itself as 
um, this this victim that is constantly under attack, right, and is constantly in need to defend itself from its hostile neighbors. And that's the narrative that's been pushed for decades, right, um, around the world. But the question is, why do they have hostile neighbors? <laughs> right. right. And that's the question that they never ask is why is yeah. it that the, the, that our neighbors are so, as they put it, hostile? They're, they're quote unquote hostile for a reason because you took somebody else's country and you kicked them out. And, and so this is the part that Israel is always attempting to decontextualize what it has done. It attempts to turn Palestinians into somehow irrational actors. Um, it completely tries to turn Palestinians into not only irrational actors, but, but this threat that, that they must eradicate. When the whole point is that Palestinians are actually very rational. Anybody who is facing um, the ethnic cleansing from, of their home, from their home, is going to push back. Anybody whose house is being taken over is going to push back. Of course they are. Nobody wants to be, to be removed from their home. Nobody wants to feel unsafe in their home and in their homeland. And that's the part that Israel isn't willing to understand. They want history to end somehow with, um, for Palestinians with the creation of the state of Israel. And then, you know, then his re- history ends. There's no, there's no, and then it begins again on October 7th. This is the way right. that Israel has always positioned itself. So there isn't anything that happened before 1948. And there's nothing that happened after from 1948 mm-hmm. until, until the current day. That's the way that they want us to behave. And of course, people are seeing through it. Yeah, exactly. I think any sort of, um, I don't even know, like solace. There's, there's nothing, I, I truly feel like nothing good, you don't feel like anything good has happened. Nothing good um, has come out of, of any of this, of course, the, this mass slaughter and genocide. But the one, the one tiny positive thing that I feel like I have seen is what you exactly what you just said is maybe somewhere people are seeing through it. The, the people that are witnessing it, um, the people, you know, whose screens this is coming across, the people who are paying attention. I mean, I'm constantly on social media, right? And I was on social media, you know, however many years ago when I was in, in college too, but I've noticed such a huge difference um, in the way that people, especially young people, um, how their opinions are being formed right now. And Israel and the U.S. will say, oh, you know, young people are being brainwashed by TikTok and by social media, and, you know, they're being fed all these lies to hate Israel, whatever. But I actually think, exactly like you said, people are just seeing through that Israeli narrative. They're seeing right through the propaganda. They're seeing right through the U.S. government, um, you know, propaganda and support for Israel, because when a young person opens up their phone, right, and they follow whoever they follow from Gaza. They see bombs being rained down, people being displaced, children being killed, people starving and freezing to death in in tents in in refugee camps in Gaza. And then they see Israel and the U.S. saying, like, Israel is the victim. Israel needs to defend itself. Israel has a right to defend itself. Um, But then they see you know, whatever Israeli, like official Israeli propaganda is going out there, I think, in my opinion, is being actively undermined by what Israeli soldiers themselves are actually posting on social media directly to TikTok, Instagram, Telegram, whatever it may be. We, every single day, there is a new video of soldiers acting so callously um, in Gaza, blowing up homes, mocking Palestinians, burning down their homes, um, you know, doing marriage proposals, save the date announcements before they blow up a home, all of these things that are so callous um, and so inhumane and make such a mockery of, of human life, people are seeing that and saying, wait, how are, like, I don't get how we're being told that this is the victim here. You know, something doesn't make sense. And so that's also been something really interesting to witness is that 
Israel's propaganda machine, like you said, they just don't have good product. But also I think they're actively being undermined by their own soldiers and their own social media, those soldiers, social media activity that people are witnessing and being like, hey, this is really messed up. It's a few things. You're absolutely right. So first, it's a very bad product. And no matter what you do, you can have as many influencers to try to claim that the product is good. We've all seen through this. It's a bad product. But second, there's such a level of arrogance to these soldiers that they think that that these videos are only being viewed by them. And they've dehumanized so, Palestinians so much that they don't even see Palestinians as humans, like they don't even see that what they're doing is wrong. And they they arrogantly believe that what they're doing is actually kind of cute. He, who blows up a Palestinian house for your child's second birthday? Who takes over a Palestinian house and writes a save the date um, to your, to, to, as a wedding announcement? unless you just fundamentally don't see Palestinians as humans. And and people see through that. So they see through the bad product when they see how Israel's bombing kids, bombing hospitals, bombing schools, when you see people being pulled out of rubble, when you see the, the level of dignity that people, that Palestinians have, and when you see the lack of dignity that Israelis have. And they've shown it time and again, day in and day out. They're so arrogant with their lack of dignity that I that, that soldiers actually think that what they're doing is cute. And, and people see past that. You know, it, it, you remind me actually of something. Um, there's, you, you know, having lived here, it, it's a very racist society. And people are very open about their racism in, in ways that I've never experienced in other countries around the world that are racist. The United States is racist. Um, but this is such a, an open level of racism and actually kind of a, a pride in, in racism. And, and when you live here for a while, the racism becomes so normalized that people who are from the outside and come in after a while, they take on that same level of racism and that those the, the racist statements stop affecting them because it just becomes par for the course. So I've heard many, many, many diplomats, journalists, others say, oh, but isn't that the way Israeli society is? So rather than them questioning the racism, it's just kind of like, oh, they just normalize it and accept it. This is what these soldiers are doing now is that it's it's such a high level of dehumanization that it's become normal in many ways to see these videos of people blowing up a Palestinian house to, to celebrate their child's second birthday, to take over a Palestinian house for a save the date, to rummage through Palestinian um, clothes and, uh, and and find lingerie, God forbid, um, to, to go through... Uh, their their kitchens and look at at what it is that Palestinians used to cook. Um, it's become so commonplace now that 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 Israelis don't even see it any longer. Mm-hmm. That's how normal it, it's become. But yet, when you're on the outside, this is not normal because it isn't normal. Yeah. And that's the glimpse that that the rest of the world is now seeing. They're mm-hmm. actually seeing what we live every day. Yeah. Yeah. So many of the stories, like especially the last one that you mentioned, and I think a lot of us have seen these videos of Israeli soldiers going in, um, you know, and rummaging through Palestinian homes. I saw a video of a soldier, um, some soldiers. There was a video that went viral very recently of a group of soldiers. I don't know. I guess they're in the same troop or whatever it is. um, And they edited this whole video together where, you know, they were cooking in the house, they were using the kitchen, they were doing all this stuff. And then, you know, they left. And as they left, they burned the house down. Yeah. Um, and I, I truly couldn't believe what I was seeing, the levels of 
just the levels of dehumanization, um, especially when you know that if that Palestinian family who lived in that home, if they're even still alive, that they're not that far away from where their home is, um, maybe just a few kilometers away seeking refuge in maybe a school or in a camp or somewhere. And store, like seeing videos like that immediately, in my mind, harken back to the stories that we've heard about the Nakba, right? And how the Israeli soldiers, you know, they kicked families out from their home. And in, in some place, in some, you know, the settlers or the soldiers, when they got to the home, there was still food on the table or the food was still warm. And I know yeah. all over Palestine, you have in the West Bank, you have Palestinian refugees who were kicked out of their homes in the Nakba, who are living, living literal kilometers away from where their village either still stands and is being occupied by settlers, where their village was destroyed to the ground. So that experience is, and, and you said, you mentioned the Nakba at the beginning, that this is, it's so clear that this is another Nakba, but this time it's being like broadcasted to us. It's live. On our, it's live. It's happening live. And that that is so crazy. Um, and what's even crazier than that is that I think there's always been this, I, I've heard this before, you know, my even friends have said, you know, what if there was, what if there were phones or what if there was social media, like back when the Nakba happened? maybe would that have changed things or would Israel and the world not be denying our history for 75 years if there was more documentation, but we're witnessing a Nakba now live and that denial is still happening. You, you remind me of a, a few things. Um, my, my late father was from a, a small town just outside of Nazareth called the Limjedin. And in 1948, his family, and not just his family, the entire town fled to neighboring Nazareth. Some fled even further to Lebanon, to Syria, to Jordan. My father um, ended up living in a house that is exactly, exactly three kilometers away from his original home. He was never allowed to go back to Limjedin, um, even, you know, in, until his death in, in 2021. Um, he, he used to talk to me and describe that for him, it wasn't just a question of losing his house. Um, and my grandmother used to say, say the same thing. It wasn't just a question of losing your house, but about losing your home and that this this because the, there's a difference between a house and a home the security the safety but also losing um having israel rob them of community of 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 um of who they are and and forever living in a place that 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 isn't yours where you're yearning to go back so you know but and as I said, from my, my father who fled when he was nine years old and died at the age of 82 for all of those years, he was never able to go back to his home, to his land. And, and that's what it's like to live as a Palestinian. And this is what we're witnessing today. So the decisions that, that I used to hear my grandmother talk about, um, when when she when she was describing what happened to her during the Nakba and what the Israelis did and how they had to take the decision to flee, I understood it on a logical level before, but now in my core, in my core, I understand it. I feel it because I know that I know what they had to how they were weighing things and what they were seeing happening around them and how for them it was a question of life or death 
and in Ghazi, in Gaza, it's the same thing. It's a question of life or death. But, he, you know, when I, I used to think the same thing. If only people saw, if only they had. But the problem is, is that this is the most documented place ever. There are more reports that come out about Israel's atrocities every year than on any country around the world. Um, in some cases, tenfold of any place um, around the world, if not more. So it's not a question of not knowing. It's a question of not wanting to act. And, and that's why I think so much of what you were saying about the, the images that we're seeing in the social media and the, the fact that it's a bad product, we wouldn't be seeing Yumna these, we wouldn't be seeing people in the millions coming out week after week around the world demanding that Israel stop if uh, if they actually believed the bad product and the and the bad influencers. It's because they're seeing this. At the same time, I every day I see a new image and I say, this is it. This is going to be the image that's going to strike at the hearts of people. And then the next day, this is going to be the image. And here we are 90 days into Israel's attack on Gaza. And we've seen tens of thousands of images, each more gruesome than the, than the next. And it hasn't moved the politicians, but it has moved people. It has moved people. And that's where I think the, the change is happening, is that it's, we're, we're even seeing a different tone when it comes to um, like people, the influence that people are having is actually influencing politicians in a way that I didn't expect would happen. So yes, we have not seen uh, calls for a ceasefire by Biden. Be, let's be clear. But for the first time, we are hearing people talking about halting arms to Israel. For the first time, we are hearing people talking about Palestinian freedom, including on a political level. For the first time, we are talking, hearing people talk about the illegality of occupation and the siege. And that is simply because all of these images have driven people and, and people are coming out in the millions because this affects them too. This is an issue of global humanity and affects them too. So I'm not, um, we're paying a very heavy price, but I'm not, uh, but, and I, I'm, I don't know how to say this. We're paying a very heavy price and I don't want to feel despair. Yeah. Because I feel that that there has been such um, that Palestinians have so, so shown the world such dignity, and Israel has not, and that is has really moved people, mm -hmm. and that moving of people, I ultimately believe will change the reality for Palestinians on the ground. It really will. It really will. And I think you just have to believe that, right? Because how else do you, like, do you, yeah. you know, reconcile everything that's happening, these feelings of despair and hopelessness? And what you, what you talked about is a feeling that I, I, I truly think everyone has had is today will be the day, this image of babies left to decompose in their hospital beds, this image of, uh, I don't know, you know, people being buried alive by every, every image is just, there's more horror every day. And so it's hard to feel um, any sort of hope, but yeah, seeing people, seeing people come out um, in numbers that we've never witnessed before, um, seeing so many people newly brought to this issue, to this cause, sort of awakened by everything that's happening. Um, and it, it, it does give you some 
some hope or some faith that hopefully the end is near, that this genocide, first and foremost, will, that the bombing will stop, that there will be a ceasefire. But then even more than that, you know, it, it doesn't just end there. Even if the bombing ends, Palestinians are still living under occupation. They're still living under apartheid and under an even more like volatile and aggressive state and settler population. Um, so the violence is still, still very much there. Um, but I think what we're seeing now really is as a result of these protests and these, you know, changes in public opinion, it's very clear that Israel is feeling very threatened. The U.S. is feeling threatened in its support of Israel. And that's, I mean, in, in my opinion, and I'd be curious to hear what, what you think about this is, you know, the responses that we've seen, like, for example, you know, South Africa filed that appeal with the, the ICJ, um, with the International um, Court of Justice against um, against Israel to, to stop the genocide. And we had U.S. Uh, officials saying, you know, that is completely baseless. It has no basis in fact. Um, and... I don't know, to me, you know, we see that we're like, okay, something's, something's not adding up. This is the sort of gaslighting that we've been talking about, right? But I think when people see that, they don't believe anymore when the U.S. says, no, 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 that's not true. Don't believe that. People are saying, no, we're really witnessing something happening. There's clearly a disconnect between what is actually happening and what you're trying to support. Um, and I think that's representative of just like the desperation from Israel and its allies to um, to keep it in power in the face of so much global um, support behind behind Palestine. The amazing thing is that that so much has become clear. Um, do you know how sometimes like I don't know if you've ever noticed when you're when you're here, but the clearest days are are sometimes the coldest days, right? Where there's not a single cloud in the sky and you can see everything super clearly. That's where we're at right now. The everything has become clear. It's become clear that this is an Israeli attack, genocide on Gaza, but not just an Israeli attack on Gaza, an Israeli-American attack on Gaza. It's become very clear just how the United States, as much as it may try to claim that it's an honest broker, it's become clear that it is doing Israel's bidding. We've seen it with the fact that they haven't been, a, that they vetoed um, a number of UN Security Council resolutions and then abstained from the other one. And it's become clear when you look at the history of the U.S. use of the veto that it's only ever been used in two instances. One is when it comes to Israel, first and foremost. The second is when it comes to Russia on a much smaller scale. So it's become clear that, that, that this is Israel and the U.S. in lockstep with one another. But it's also become clear that that everything that the world did up until this point has been a complete and utter failure. That the world, leave aside the US, which we know is in lockstep with Israel, but everybody else has also failed Palestinians. Country-wise, I'm not talking about people. And it's also become clear that there's a huge difference between the people of the world and the leadership of the world. Mm -hmm. All of this has become clear. And lastly, what's become clear is this idea that there's some notion of global human rights or international human rights or an international system. There is no system. It's might is right. And people have deluded themselves over these years into thinking that somehow there is going to be countries that will rush to the defense of others to prevent genocide. You know, this is the, this is, there have been other examples of genocide, 
But this is a genocide like no other, because this is being perpetrated against a civ defenseless civilian refugee population, refugees who've been raided, refugees by Israel. And, and, the, and if anything, this is the time where you should be seeing the world community act and rush to come to the defense of this refugee, stateless, defenseless, by the way, child population, and instead they're not, you know, just yeah. except for South Africa. Yeah. We've covered so much ground in this conversation, <laughs> and I really appreciate you taking the time to to speak with us, to share your thoughts, um, to share your own personal stories. I mean, the story of your your father and your family's like Nakba story. I mean, I had goosebumps listening to that. I think there's as as much as we witness all the atrocities and so many people's hearts have been moved um, and called to action by what they're seeing in Palestine. Truly, no one can ever like fathom the experience. Yeah. Um, the multi-layered, multi-generational experience that Palestinians experience every single day um, and are experiencing now to a degree that no one, I think not even many Palestinians could even fathom. So thank you for sharing that. Thank you for speaking with us. Um, is there anything else that you would like to, to share? No, I think that's it. I, I was going to share an anecdote if, you, if you'd like. Please do, yeah. Uh, so yesterday, um, my friend Mossad Abu Toha, the writer, he called and he said, um, what is it that we're not doing? And I said, what do you mean? And he said, like, what is it that we're not doing to get the world to act? Do they, see, do they need to see more pictures? Do they need to read more poems? Do they like, do they need to hear more stories? You tell me, you know, you, you lived in the West. What is it that they, what is it that we're not doing? And, and, and his, his point was, it wasn't a rhetorical one. His question was not a rhetorical one at all. It was very much a question of when is it that we're going to see change? I mean, when is it that we're going to, like, when is it that people are going to sit sit up and say, "Yes, that's enough. Yes, they've sustained enough," um, and and then interspersed in that, he was telling me about his home and how the Israelis bombed his home and they bombed his library uh, that he worked so hard to to put together. And I th I shared the story of my my own father and uh, and how the Israelis not only erased Ilim Jedel, my father's town, but then replaced it with an Israeli town called Migdal Ha'amek, which incidentally, it, it's, um, as a Palestinian, you can't buy a house there. And, uh, and so I, you know, I can't even buy a house on the very land that I should have, um, that we own, inherited, exactly. And he said to me, do you think that's gonna happen to us? Hmm. And what do you say? Yeah. What do you yeah. say? And it's not even it's it isn't a rhetorical question because it's not we have rhetorical. seen Israelis advocating for the complete flattening of Gaza in order to build settlements. And that's also something that hasn't really been talked about a lot is, and, you know, we, we discussed sort of the, what individual soldiers have been doing on the ground. A lot of them, a lot of their sort of, um, mental, like their, their mentality is surround, you know, has to do with this idea of conquering back Gaza, right. And getting back the settlements and resettling Gaza, um, you know, to the to Gush Katif and these other settlements that were pulled out in the 2005 engagement. So that question of, is that going to happen to us where, you know, an Israeli town is going to be built on top of our home and we're not even going to be able to go there. That is not 
a rhetorical question that is not out of the realm of, you know, possibilities or because A, it's happened for 75 years. So many of Gaza are already the descendants of refugees from the Nakba. But I mean, that is literally what Israel is advocating for exactly. now, to, to exactly. wipe it out and to build settlements on top of it. And and what do you say to a person who who just survived a genocide, whose family is still trapped in Gaza, who he hasn't been able to reach his brother for days? Um, I mean, what do you say? Yes, this is what Israel is going to do. Mm-hmm. This is the this is the world in which this is the reality that we're living in, where we're 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 in a place where he's trying to seek comfort. From from me because I I didn't have to go through that genocide, and there's no comfort I can give him because I know that my father went through a genocide in in 1948 mm-hmm. and and survived it, and you know what the Israeli plans are and you see what the Israeli plans and are and you you see the the soldiers um, talking about as you put it resettling you see the 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 politicians talking about going back. And you hear these mealy mouth statements from by the Americans saying that it won't happen, but I don't believe them, and I don't think anybody should believe them. Right? You see, you know, the State Department saying, you know, Gazans should not be displaced yeah. while they're actively arming and funding Israel to drop the bombs that displace Palestinians from their homes exactly. in Gaza. Exactly. Look, they're going to call. They're going to do. Just in the same way that Israelis spun the Nakba as being a voluntary flight, mm. they're going to spin this Nakba as being mm. a voluntary flight as well. Yeah. As a humanitarian, exactly. you know, it's, it's, it's actually humanitarian of us to move Gazans into to Egypt or wherever it may be. Exactly, exactly. To save their lives. Exactly. Exactly. Rather than, uh, I was talking to a friend about this the other day, rather than doing what should have been done, which is just in the same way that Palestinians can flee into Gaza, how about fleeing the other direction, into their homes, right? Into into the places that they're from, the, 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 the areas of the envelope, Yaffa, and so on. Israel's so humanitarian. Why is that not a possibility? Right. Letting them go home. Yeah. Thank you, Diana. Thank My you pleasure. so much. My I pleasure. really appreciate your time um, and your conversation um, and, and your insights. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.